welcome to the Copperopolis Day of the Human Geography Programme. There is a lot going on at this site, so you'll find that there's a lot of us who are involved in sharing this virtual version of the Copperopolis Day with you. You've got content on the economic geography aspects of this site from Chris and from Kevin. Dave will be taking you through the broader human geography that we want you to look at at this site. And he'll also be discussing the assignment that we want you to do at this site. And what I'm going to be doing is giving you a broad historical overview of this incredible place and the heritage and regeneration project that we are stood right in the middle of. So let's think about where we are. We are right in the middle of the Morva Stadium area of the city. So the Liberty Stadium is over to my left and the Morva Shopping Centre. In front of me is the Tarway River, stretching down to where Sainsbury's and the Docks area are. And behind that, Kilvey Hill rises up to make the skyline of this area. If you were here in the 18th century, you would be standing in the middle of the noisy, smoky, belchy, sulphurous heart of Copperopolis. So the historian Louise Miskell tells us that Swansea was to copper what Detroit was to the car industry and what Manchester was to cotton. We are standing in the middle of the skeletal remains of what was the world's first global industry. The way that the copper industry from Swansea was dependent on incoming copper from as far flung a places as Chile, Patagonia, Peru, and at the same time was using the coal seam from the lower Swansea Valley that we are standing right along the top of, made this huge global industry. So Louise describes Copperopolis as an articulated production network that had transcontinental reach. I think it's really interesting if you stand in what is now a shopping center and some derelict buildings, it is really hard to imagine that. So let's have a think about what these buildings are telling us about what went on here in the past. So what happened in the 18th century was that the Industrial Revolution exploded all over the old world, all over Europe and the UK. And people needed metal to build for boats, for infrastructure and for the way that the world was changing and the Industrial Revolution was exploding. What happened here was the development of an entire new way of producing copper that allowed the area to produce copper in the quantities that it was needed. Before the development of what was called the Swansea process, it was actually an entire new way of smelting metal that was invented here in this valley. Copper was smelted in small production around Scandinavia and Europe using charcoal and using wood. And you smelted copper in small amounts near where the source of the fuel was, near to where the wood was. What happened in Swansea was that they started using mineral rich coal, which they had access to in huge quantities, to smelt metal in way bigger quantities and volumes than had ever been seen before. Between 1740 and around 1850, at times, Swansea was producing up to a third of the total amount of copper produced across the whole globe. And that was dependent on everything from the port, which was busy and bustling and would have had ships bringing copper ore in from all over the world, to really specific networks within the UK. Copper ore would also come over from Cornwall, and the coal barges would go back laden with coal from here, exchanging it for copper, that coal then being used to power the pumps that kept coal mines in Cornwall free of water. It was the first time that the globe had seen this networked industry that allowed the increased production of an industrial product on an absolutely huge scale. Because it was such a huge industry with its finger in businesses and communities all over the world, not surprisingly, Swansea Copper was heavily involved in the slave trade of the colonial era. The Cuban mining town of El Cobre was staffed by a mix of African slaves and enforced Chinese laborers, and they were all under the service of the copper communities of Swansea. 
So as we moved into the 19th century, the global copper industry changed and Swansea's era of copperopolis came to an end. And at that point, what was left was two miles in the Swansea Valley of slag heaps, land that was so polluted, very few plants could grow on it. And the city and county were faced with the enormous Lower Swansea Valley Regeneration Project. And if we look at the hill behind me, Kilbay Hill is now covered in non-native pine trees. And that is seen as being really problematic because we want native woodland that's good for supporting biodiversity in our urban and in our regenerated areas. But actually, that lodgepole pine was planted for a reason because it and the larch areas surrounding it are able to cope with the incredibly polluted soil. So those lodgepole pine will actually effectively help clean the soil for a few decades of growth and are now being stripped out and replaced with native woodland. One of the things that you'll see if you're in Swansea around Christmas time is that communities can go and cut one of the pine trees themselves to have a free Christmas tree. So the number of different aspects of biological elements, geography elements, the way that this landscape needs looking after, as well as the heritage and regeneration projects, just makes this a really fascinating human and physical geography landscape that we're right in the middle of. So when the Lower Swansea Valley project started to look at how we were going to clean up this area, essentially a six or eight inch cap of topsoil was placed on top of the polluted landscape. And if you dig down now, when the council and communities are making tree pits, for example, you go through a really just a few inches of topsoil and then you are immediately into the waste products from this massive industry. One of the most interesting ways to get a sense of the scale of this industrial landscape is to just dig down into the soil. You see this landscape right there under our feet. So what you can see behind me are one of the derelict buildings that the Copperopolis project is going to redevelop and regenerate as a tourist site where people can come and learn about Swansea's copper history and learn about the industrial processes that went on here and everything that was involved in this huge community that spread up through the Havard, through Morriston, and through this whole land or site. So one of the things that we're going to be doing on this assignment is thinking about how we might explain that heritage geography and that historical context to the communities who now live here. So we're now going to head over the river, across from the Morva site where we are now, to take a look at one of the oldest parts of the Copperopolis area. So we're at the White Rock site and we're standing on this mound of earth that has been landscaped and it's right along the banks of the Tarway below the Kilvey Hill. So we're standing right next to a river and we should really be on a flat bank or a flood plain, but we're not, we're on this significant feature. On closer inspection, we're also standing on something that is not made of rock. The material this area is made from, when we dig under a very shallow cap rock of soil and scrub, basically looks like the surface of Mars. There's visible melted metal parts. There are rocks with bubbles in them, showing that at some point, this was waste from the copper industry's giant smelting furnaces. The mound is clearly quite a feature and it stands above the river and it really does not look natural. It's been landscaped now and it's a popular spot for local residents to find some greenery and space and for younger generations to play on their bikes. And we're standing in what was the oldest part of the Swansea Valley Copper Works at a site that was known as White Rock. Use your mind's eye to strip away this small mount and think about what it might have been in the past and what was here before it. We're surrounded by evidence of an industrial past. Behind the mount, 
is the remnants of what looks like a bridge. And beyond it is a section of what is clearly a man-made canal. But there's very little left now. Just a hint of the huge infrastructures that once were here. Unlike the Morva side of the river, most of whatever was at this site is long gone. So what we are actually standing on when we climb up the White Rock Mount is the rubble of the oldest of the copper smelting sites that was open and working long before the turn of the 18th century. By 1736, this was the White Rock Copper Works and it was part of the Swansea landscape for nearly 250 years. The opening of White Rock at the turn of the 18th century marked the transformation of this valley and it sparked this period of sustained growth for the city. In 1801, the population of Swansea was 7,000. A century later, it was 130,000. And at one point, there were more than 600 copper furnaces working along the Swansea Valley. What transformed Swansea was the establishment of the Swansea or the Welsh process for refining copper. White Rock was opened by a Bristolian called John Costa. What eventually emerged from this innovative time was a process in which copper ore was combined with coal in a mix of one part ore to three parts coal and heated in a series of furnaces each one increasing the purity of the copper ore until the final product was 97% pure copper. Walking down off the mound and heading downstream, we can see a series of ruined walls and structures that look like they were part of a bridge. And the bridge, in fact, connected with Kilvey Hill via a series of four arches that were long gone. But it was a major feature of the White Rock site. Although the only thing that is left is the two upright sides to the bridge, this may once again become an important place in Swansea if the Kilvey Hill cable car development happens, as the plan is for this site to become the starting base station for the cable car. This is just one of the ways that Swansea is looking at whether it can use its past to enhance its future. And we can think about what that might be like if this site again becomes an important part of the city, but for tourism, not for industry. Below the remains of the bridge, we can see what's very clearly a human-made stretch of water. It's derelict and it's rubbish-filled, but it was clearly part of a canal at one point. We can just about see through the weeds and what we're looking at is part of the Swansea Canal. Constructed between 1794 and 1798 by the Swansea Canal Navigation Company, the canal rose through 375 feet via 36 locks, all the way from the sea level at Swansea up the valley to Abercrave. It was built to carry coal down to the industries in the lower Swansea Valley and out for export around the world. And this new link to the sea enabled the development all along this valley and the towns that we know today. Further behind, you can actually get in to see what is called a cut and covered section of the canal. It's now filled with rubbish and it's derelict. But at one point, this was a really innovative transport method. The railway connected to the canal here and it was an essential part of the valley's transportation systems. Further up the valley, in Cledach, sections of the Swansea Canal still exist and are far more developed. But here, all that remains is this highly derelict strip of water and some sections of the buried canal hidden through rough iron gates and now mostly a site for dumping waste. 
Standing at the White Rock site now, it's hard to imagine this valley filled with 600 furnaces belching polluted air into the sky. And we can get a sense of the tension between the industry, the thriving economy as Copperopolis grew up, the fact that there were jobs available and development and a booming city was emerging. And the fact that it was not a very pleasant place to live. There was a huge amount of pollution being belched into the atmosphere. The flames from the furnaces would be lighting the sky at night. At Stedford in 1887, a poem called The Road to Hell was a winning entry. And it's all about Landor. It came to pass in days of yore, the devil chanced upon Landor. Quoth he, by all this fume and stink, I can't be far from home, I think. And it gives us a sense of the different issues of this site. The fact that there were jobs, there was wealth to be had. You could find work here, you could find skilled work here and earn a living. But slowly, as the 19th century passed on, that pollution became more and more of an issue. It was affecting people's health. There are reports in the local newspaper of cattle dying after grazing on the lands around the Swansea Valley. And soon it became a real issue and the greatest minds of science at the time, Faraday working with the Vivian family, were racking their brains for how to reduce the amount of sulfurous waste that came out of the stacks. And whilst they never really made things that much better, they did make some improvements to the process over time. The last site that we come across on the White Rock side is this old dock that is clearly man-made and it's clearly a place where there was some kind of transportation up and down the Tawe River. And this is the docking site of the White Rock Ferry. The ferry was an absolutely essential way for families to travel between White Rock and the Havard on the other side. The ferry itself was a flat-bottomed boat that sculled across the river, taking up to 20 passengers at a time. It ran for nearly 150 years, and in that time, just three families, the Owens, the Llewellyns and the Clarks, were responsible for running it, and it stayed within those families for a century and a half. A chain would guide the ferry in bad weather or poor visibility, and it would be an essential part of transportation, both for work and also for getting families over into the Havard so that they could make their way into town to use the services and the shops that were there. In the landscape around us at White Rock, We see up to Kilvey Hill behind us and out in the other direction across the new industrial estate at Morva and the all-important Liberty Stadium. In the 1960s, Swansea was keen to forget its industrial past and emerge with this reclaimed landscape of shopping centres, industrial estates and light commerce. There was very little sense of the heritage of the valley and what these sites meant to Wales. The Lower Swansea Valley Project, established in 1961, was a post-industrial land reclamation project on an absolutely huge scale. By the start of the 1960s, the Swansea Valley was Europe's most polluted post-industrial landscape. And when the reclamation project started to clean up the valley, it just blew up the entire White Rock site. The river was toxic sludge, Kilvey was a barren wasteland, and the buildings on the site were seen as part of that embarrassing, polluted history. Whereas now, we would value those buildings as part of the heritage of our city. At the time, the Lower Swansea Valley Project just wanted to erase them. And what we're standing on at the Mount is the remains of that building. This brings us to the end of our exploration of the heritage geography of Copperopolis. Don't forget there are loads of additional resources on the module page and if you're based in Swansea and it's possible to do so within current COVID regulations, you can also visit the site yourself.
Thanks for watching.